Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Corn Baptist Church. Welcome here in the building, but also welcome to folks who may be joining us online. Um, if you, you don't know, if you've not been before, we do stream the services. And so there's a camera over in the corner there and uh, the backs of your heads might be on. So if you are particularly camera shy, it's always better to sit on that side of church than that side of church. But um, it, yeah, it's a, it's a, there's no close-ups of folks, not even a close-up of, of me. You'd think people would want that, wouldn't you? A nice close-up of the preacher, but no, I'm in the distance even on the uh, online. So welcome to Corn Baptist Church, but also welcome to our morning service, because we haven't come here just to be in a nice uh, building this morning. Those that are here, we've come to join together and to join together in worshipping God and in considering God's word and what it might say into our lives. So welcome to our morning service. After the first part of the service, as usual, the children will go out to their groups and uh, we'll carry on uh, with some uh, boring activities for the adults. Uh, the children escape that and have exciting things in Sunday Club. Um, notices this morning. So, as usual, most are in the notice sheet and hopefully folks have got a copy of that. Um, someone did just say, are there any more printed ones? And I said, no. So if you normally like to pick up a printed one, um, because you struggle to print it at home and you struggle to, to read it online, then do have a word with me afterwards and I'll print some more off quickly. It only takes a few moments, two or three clicks on the laptop to print off some more. But, uh, that's got all the notices in. I just want to make one correction. Um, I can't remember, on Friday, we're going into Holloway House to do a communion service. It's the first time since before COVID. I can't remember whether many church folks used to come in anyway. Various people do sometimes come into the old people's homes for services, but I put the wrong time in the notice sheet. So if you are thinking to come into the uh, care home to join in with that service, it's three o'clock, not 3.30. Um, I don't know whether Derek might have spotted that one because he's on the road to come at a different time. So uh, three o'clock, not 3.30. And if you're praying for us, then uh, you can pray at three o'clock, not 3.30. The other thing just to draw your attention to is that we have a, a special offering this morning, as well as the, the ongoing opportunity to give to the work of the church. We're taking this week and next week uh, an offering for the emergency appeal for the earthquake. And there's an offering plate in the foyer and another one just uh, by that exit to the church there. If you want to give to that, you may already have given through one of the other avenues that there are, but we just thought we'd make that opportunity available and we'll pass our gifts on through Tear Fund, one of the Christian charities that we regularly support and they've been working in Syria for some time already and their partners are involved in some of the relief efforts. And they're also part of the Disasters Emergency Committee. Okay, that's all the notices. Let's uh, turn towards our worship. And I'd like to begin by reading just a few verses from Paul's letter to the Romans. Now in the New Testament, Paul's letter to the Romans is quite a long letter, and it's full of uh, words about God, which is mostly like teaching about what God is like. And uh, then he starts teaching about what people should do. But in between those two things, he bursts out into praise. And I just want to read those words of praise to lead into our praise this morning. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him, are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that leads us nicely into our first song, To him be the glory for all he has done. So let's, if you're able to, stand and we'll worship together and give glory to God and glory to Jesus. Thank <laughs> you. 
Please do sit down. Let's just bow our heads a moment in prayer. Lord God, we would indeed this morning look and see our God. We thank you for the freedom and the privilege that we have to come and meet together and to worship you. The freedom that we have to have our Bibles and to look at the words of God in the Bible. The freedom that we have to gather as your people and to be in a crowd to worship you. And we ask, Lord, that this morning we would make the most of that opportunity that we have to look and see our God, to do so together, encouraging each other and building each other up. And so, Lord, we just commit this time into your hands and ask that each one of us might see something more of you this day. And our hearts and our minds, our spirits might be lifted up in worship and in adoration to our God. Glory, glory to our God. Amen. Hand over to Mandy, who's going to come and talk to us for a bit.
Come on. Come on. I'm in. Okay. She says, there's another little clip to put on. There we are. Okay. Has anybody ever um, met somebody sort of, well, they've, they've gone on holiday and they've met somebody there on holiday who kind of lives there and then they've gone back to that same place again and met up with them again? Have, they, have anybody ever done that? I, I was a little girl, I did that, didn't I, Mother? Do you remember? In Wales, the little girl, my mum's going, oh, I remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> Do you remember? No, she's absolutely not. I'm talking to my mum. <laughs> anyway, I believe that's what happened to me once as a child. I went to the place and uh, I met a girl and then we went back there the following year or whatever and, and we met up again on the park and it was really quite, quite lovely. But nobody here has had any similar experience, no. Oh, you, oh, sorry, you have, yeah, sorry, sorry, you have, yeah. And it's fab, isn't it? It's lovely. And, and when you went back, you know, were they exactly as you expected them to be? Was it as good the second time of meeting them as it was the first? <laughs> oh, right, okay then. He's, can't remember what he's had for breakfast either, so that's okay. I want you to imagine now then, okay, so it's never actually happened to most of you, okay, but I want you to imagine now that you meet somebody, okay, you, uh, somewhere, and you really, really get on well with them. Do you know they're just doing life so well? They're brilliant, you know, and you like think, I really like this person. I'm sorry, I'm only here for a short space of time, really. Um, but but they're getting on well and, and you really like them. And then, you know, you, you go away from that place and you think, I can't wait to go back there and meet them again. OK, yeah. And so then you sort of uh, you, you, you kind of do your life and then you think, oh, going back there next week. I can't wait to meet that person again because they were brilliant. And so then you go back and you meet up with that person again and they're not quite what they were last time. You see, people have told them that to always be honest wasn't such a great thing. So they sort of gave up on truth a little bit. And somebody else <laughs> told them to, uh, to always be kind wasn't such a great thing either. So they were no longer as kind and friendly and they changed. And so you kind of wanted to say to them, what's, what's happened to you? And it just turns out they'd listened to the wrong people and they just weren't as you remembered them being. Today's Bible story that we're looking at today uh, during the sermon is a little bit like that. You see, Paul, when he last saw the Galatian church, they were doing so well. To visit them, and they weren't doing quite so well. They'd started to get back into the old habits. People had told them that some of the old stuff was good. And so they'd started to do some of the old stuff again. And Paul said, I don't know who's told you that the old stuff was good, but it wasn't good. And it certainly wasn't somebody who's walking with Jesus. The old stuff was not good. And I can't believe that you have believed it and gone back to some of the stuff that I told you to not go back to. Now, who likes church? Max? Do you like church? <laughs> oh, bless him. Can I have a sense of if you like church? No. <laughs> I have it on good authority from his granny that Max likes church. Is that right, Alison? Yeah, you, yeah. Uh, your granny told me last week, Max, that you like church. Can I have a thumbs up, Max? No. <laughs> Maddie, do you like church? Can I have a thumbs up from Maddie? Woohoo! Do you like church? Can I have a thumbs up from you? How about you coming here? And telling everybody else at church got a thumbs up for church. Well, you see, you see, when we're actually here at church, Max, is he doing it? Is he doing it? No, oh, leave him be. Leave him be. When we're actually here at church with everybody else who enjoys church, it's actually quite easy to give it a thumbs up, isn't it? 
it's really, really easy to do that, isn't it? The problems come when we go out those doors and we meet somebody who perhaps doesn't think church is so good, who perhaps doesn't think God is so good, who perhaps doesn't think the Bible is a really good book. And that's when the problems come, isn't it? Because that's when they can start to persuade us that things, the good things that we talk about in church, they can persuade us that they're not so good, aren't they, if we're not careful. So I think we need to just pray this morning that when we go out there, when we're not here in church with all of these other people who think that God is good and the Bible is good, and the church is good, okay, when those people try to persuade us that these good things aren't good, that we are strong, and that we can still give that thumbs up, even though people are telling us that it's not good. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, okay? What do you think, Hayley? Does that make sense? Do you think you can still give it a thumbs up when somebody out there, one of your school friends, maybe so that good do you think you can say actually it is good yeah okay let's pray father god we thank you that you are good and the bible which is also very good tells us so many many times we thank you to the, to, to fellowship with other believers here in church is also very good and we thank you that we can encourage one another in all of these good things. But Lord God, we pray that you will go with us as we go from this place. And as we meet with people at school, at work, wherever we are, we can meet people who don't think these things are good. Help us to stay strong and help us to know and even share the good things that we know about. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing another uh, worship song, and um, so one of the newer ones. We learnt it last year. We've sung it a few times. It's so new to us that we haven't actually got the the music yet. So we're going to use a video, uh, which does also give the advantage that the actions are on the video. So if you want to join in, you've got the lady on the video showing you. Just one warning: the video starts quite abruptly. Uh, there's not much of an intro on the music, so do get ready. So let's stand and get ready. Uh, take a nice breath, ready to sing. And we're going to sing, you've painted colours in the sky. In the chorus, it uh, talks about God's love being like a tidal wave, which is what got the title of the song, Tidal Wave. But you've painted colours in the sky. you painted colours in the sky, you made the clouds a tower we worship, we worship you. You've cast scars with holy hands, dusted rock with gold sands. We worship, we worship you. It's a beautiful world. Simply awesome be. It's a beautiful world. We bow down by the world we made, in the King of Grace. Our voices in wonder and power under our fall. We bow I'm 
going to go out to their groups i hope you have a good time hope the teachers have a good time as well We're going to carry on with a uh, somewhat quieter, more reflective song. Um, there's a practical reason why we have a song at this point in the service. It does give the, some of the parents who've taken children out opportunity to come back rather than carrying on with lots of talking and then they feel awkward. So uh, that's one of the reasons. But also it leads us into a more um, prayerful point of the service as well. So we're going to sing this song and then we're going to have a short video from our missionaries, the Barkers. And then David's going to lead us in prayers and we'll have the Bible reading. But uh, first of all, you may like to remain seated for this song. It's a prayerful song. You may like to stand up. That's up to you. The song is Hide Me Now Under Your Wings, Cover Me Within Your Mighty Hand. Thank you. 
We've asked some of our uh, missionaries who we support to uh, record videos for us so that uh, we can see them explain their work uh, in a different kind of way to when we just have prayer letters. And hopefully that will help us when we pray for them, because we're able to visualise them a little bit more in the places where they are. And the first one of those uh, we're going to have this morning, uh, and it is uh, from Alan and Megan Barker, who are out in Nepal. So let's... Uh, just watch this video uh, and try to absorb it to help you in your future prayers for them. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm, my name's Alan Barker. And I'm Megan Barker. And uh, we're based here in Kathmandu and we're speaking from the roof of our house. So Rose has asked us to tell you a little bit about what we're involved in. Um, and it's a bit difficult to put into uh, easy words because uh, we're kind of involved in quite a lot of different uh, things, different organisations and supporting particular individuals. Overall, with the BMS, we are here to build the capacity of organisations and individuals to help them be able to better function on their own. Um, and for me, that means going to... Um, two different organisations, mostly during during my working week, and I'll uh, introduce you to some of the people that I work with a bit later. And um, for me, I'm an occupational therapist, and I was working as an occupational therapist, very hands-on. Now I'm doing more um, just trying to build up the services, develop the fact that rehabilitation is something that the farm needs, because there's still only nine OTs here. Um, and still trying to build that up and doing working with organisations that focus on that and also helping with um, children with special needs at the school where Alan works. And we also um, both use our, our master's training in organisational development and that's um, very much more a part of the, the wider role that we've now been asked to do with BMS. Although we've always sought to build up the national workforce it's been much more on an individual basis and now we're looking much more organizational. Hi so I'm now arriving at my office in the HDCS Human Development and Community Services. So HDCS is a Christian NGO that uh, supports three hospitals and some community development work working in remote areas around Nepal. And I work in this office, there's my desk over in the corner there, and here is Asta, who's one of my colleagues, and Asta's going to introduce herself. 
Yeah. Come around here so the light's not on you. <laughs> I'm Asa Shreshta. I'm the partnership manager here. I'm uh, working with the partnership and communications team. And uh, we do lots of things uh, from proposal writing to the partner communications, to hiring, to reporting back on our activities and producing a lot of communication materials. That is uh, one of our um, major uh, job tasks and responsibilities. And I work alongside Alan doing all of these things and he's been a great support and thank you for your support as well. And here is Sahara, another one of my colleagues, busy on the board, Namaste. and she's going to introduce herself as well. Uh, Namaste, I'm Sahara Mishra. I'm working as a technical coordinator on disaster risk reduction and climate change. So I basically do lots of stuff related to disaster and climate change. And we are so excited for the coming years for the uh, disaster projects and building up the resilient disaster resilient communities in Nepal. So here we are now at uh, the second place where I work during the week. Yesterday I was at HDCS and I introduced you to Sahara and Asta, who are also, which I forgot to mention, BMS supported workers. Their salary is partly paid by BMS. And here I'm at KISC, which is a mission school, but uh, where I work um, in the office, helping to raise funds through proposal writing and project design because here at KISC, they also have a section that uh, reaches out to rural Nepali schools uh, and supports those schools in developing their um, quality of education. Megan? And I'm just starting today as a volunteer. I'm going to be, um, again, using my OT skills, working with some of the children with special needs. Um, so I'm going to be coming um, for a bit of time on Tuesdays and Wednesdays just to specifically help one teacher who has quite a number of children that have special needs in her class and was looking for help so it's a great opportunity to be able to help her and um, support the work here as one of BMS partner organizations. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of an idea it's a bit a bit complicated to try and explain it very briefly but uh, hopefully that's given you a bit of an idea of what we do here in Nepal. And you'll learn more obviously as time goes on. Thank you again for your support. Yes. Thank you. Bye. That's great. Let's pray together now. Let's pray. <clears throat> you may not know, but it's it's racial uh, justice Sunday this week. That's not going to be a major focus of our prayers, but this first prayer is based on one by Dr. Martin Luther King. Eternal God, out of whose absolute power and infinite intelligence the whole universe came into being, draw us together in love and unity for one another. Help us to first see our own dignity and to unconditionally love ourselves. Give us the strength to love our neighbours and the courage to go the extra mile and love our enemies. The history of our lives is the history of eternal revolt against you. So in the light of your grace and mercy, may we learn to love you with all of our hearts, souls and minds. May we forgive just as you forgave us for what we could have been but failed to be. Give us minds to know your will. Give us hearts to love your will. Give us the devotion to live out your ways and to be all that we were made to be. In the name of the Spirit of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And a psalm of praise. This is Psalm 63 um, from the message. God, you're my God. I can't get enough of you. I've worked up such hunger and thirst for God traveling across dry and weary deserts. So here I am in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength and glory. In your generous love, I am really living at last. My lips brim praises like fountains. I bless you every time I take a breath. 
my arms wave like banners of praise to you. Amen. And then we think of uh, the earthquake situation in Turkey and Syria. Heavenly Father, our hearts are moved by the effects of the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. The grief felt by families who have lost loved ones or await news of loved ones is unimaginable. We turn to you, God of all comfort, and ask that you be close to people in the days ahead and that they might know your peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord God, we pray for those who have lost their homes or have moved to safety away from tall buildings. Please keep them warm in the midst of this harsh winter and provide all they need. We pray especially for children who are confused and frightened by what is happening. May you be for them an oasis of peace in which to take shelter. Lord God, we thank you for the swift action of those who are already responding, for the rescue teams searching for survivors. We ask for endurance and resilience for them. For those providing temporary shelter, we pray for the swift delivery of equipment. And for all those in communities offering comfort and help to their neighbors, we pray that you give them selfless compassion. And Lord, we pray for world leaders as they decide how to respond. We pray that you stir each of our hearts in generosity towards the people of Turkey and Syria. Amen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Lord, Lord, we do pray for Alan and Megan, and thank you for the video that we've just seen. And we pray for them in their work. We pray that they just might receive inspiration each day, um, that they won't get bogged down in routine. And Father God, we pray that they'll, you'll enable them to just help those that they're working with, with all the skills that you've given to them, all the training you've given to them. And we pray for Megan as she works with children uh, with disabilities in particular. Lord, help her to understand how to help in the right way and to, to give those children exactly what's needed. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. And just a prayer to finish for ourselves as we think about the week ahead. Lord, bless me with your peace. Send to me in your love that I may be secure in whose I am. Still my raging mind, that I may be free to focus on what really matters. Quiet in my prodigal tongue, that I may be careful in the words I choose. Calm my body, that I may be rested and ready to journey. Open my heart, that I may be responsive to those who need me. Make me a well of your peace. Lord, bless me with your peace, and may that peace become hospitality for others. May I offer serenity and security to those who crave shelter from the storm. May I be a discerning listener to those who need to talk. May I be a reconciling presence to those who have their differences. May the peace you have gifted me spill over into those I meet. 
make me a channel of your peace. Lord, bless me with your peace. But may that peace galvanize me to fight for world peace. Take my mind and make it think about how I can help others live with dignity. Take my tongue and make it speak for those who have no voice or power. Take my body and send me out to work against injustice and abuse. Take my heart and make it bleed for those who are broken by poverty. Make me an instrument of your peace. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Today's Bible reading is Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. It can be found in the Church Bibles on page 1171. So that's Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 to 15, found on page 1171. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is required to obey the whole law. If you are trying to be justified by law, I have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go to the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out. You will be destroyed by each other. So we're carrying on through Galatians, two-thirds of the way through and a little bit more, so we must be nearing the end. How could we sum up this part? To me, it seems, as uh, Paul turns in, I'll say Paul turns into this chapter, because the chapters were added afterwards, Paul didn't write the chapter numbers, but as Paul turns into this section, he seems to be moving on uh, a little bit from what he's been talking about in chapters one to four about the fact that the gospel is about grace what christ has done for us but some people have been trying to get the galatians to go back to jewish ways where it was all about the law and you've got to obey the law and earn your salvation and that's the whole sort of tenet of what paul's been talking about no get Stick with grace. Don't go back to thinking about law. And this section really is about that freedom that grace brings. Because when we've not got to earn salvation, 
we should be able to feel free in that grace. And Paul's saying here, don't lose the freedom that you've got through Christ. But he also says, don't abuse it in the later part of this reading. So freedom, don't lose it, but don't abuse it either. Because some ask the question, yeah, well, if we have righteousness from Christ, we've not got to earn righteousness, then surely we can just live as we like. But as we see here and through the rest of Galatians, gospel freedom should obey us to love God and to obey God out of that love. The chapter starts very emphatically. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Or it is for freedom that Christ has freed us. For freedom, we are freed. Freedom. Freedom from the law and the obligations of the law. Freedom from the burden of sin, because it burdens us because we can't fully obey the law because we are sinful by nature. Freedom from that because salvation is by grace. And that's what Paul had preached to the Galatians. And that's what they'd accepted. And a church had started in Galatians based upon that preaching. But now some others had come and were trying to tell them to obey the law. But Paul says, stand firm. Stand firm on grace. Do not let yourselves be burned again by a yoke of slavery. There's something for them to do and something for us to do, to stand firm in the grace of God. We need to remind ourselves of the freedom that we have in Christ. We need to keep that freedom in mind often. We do that by considering the means of our salvation. That's why we often have hymns that are full of words about our salvation, about the grace of God. Because we need to remind ourselves that it's what Christ has done for us. Not what we earn through hard religious service. Let's look at verse 5 for a moment. But by faith, we, we <coughs> eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. If we were trying to earn our righteousness, we wouldn't, through faith, await it. The Spirit, when we trust in Christ, gives an assurance that we have righteousness through Christ. So we can await the fulfillment of that hope when Christ returns, rather than striving to earn acceptance from God. In contrast to the way of grace, the way of the law, devalues Christ's work, as he's, Paul says in 2 and 3. Mark my words. If you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you. Every man who lets himself be circumcised is required to obey the whole law. So the law comes as a unit. Either you obey the whole law and get justified by it. If you break one part of it, you're guilty as a lawbreaker. So there's no freedom in a legalistic religion. Verse 4 makes it sound as if we can lose our salvation. You, are, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. I know in the church there are the two camps, those who believe once saved, always saved, and those who don't, and probably amongst us, there will be those that differ on this opinion. This is one of those verses that seems to point towards the fact that you can lose your salvation. Personally, I believe you can't lose your salvation. Um, and so I would understand this as being that what we lose by falling away from grace or by being alienated from Christ here is losing that value of that freedom 
in Christ. Losing that freedom to love God and to obey out of love rather than being enslaved to the law and obeying because we're trying to earn our righteousness or trying to hold on to our right standing with God by our religious lives. I think if we can lose our salvation by not doing well enough as a Christian, then that just is another way to describe works righteousness, isn't it? I believe when we're adopted by God into his family, we're adopted and we can't tear up the adoption papers. But we can lose something when we turn away from the gospel of grace. We can lose that freedom. We can lose that assurance of our salvation as we try and strive without reason, as we try and strive to earn it. Paul actually seems to be fairly confident that in the end the Galatians will hold on to the gospel of grace. See what he says in verse 10, I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. So although he feels the need to make this warning, he's confident that they will respond positively to this warning and hold on to the gospel of grace. One thing that uh, perhaps might um, just help us in this point as well is I put a reference in there from 1 John. Let's just look at that. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. So it may be that if a Christian seems to have fallen away from grace, it may be an indication that actually they never truly believed in the first place. And that's why they've fallen away. Again, they've not lost their salvation. They just never really had that salvation in the first place. And that's the kind of things that Paul is talking about here. You know, there may be those amongst the Galatians who made a, a partial response to Christ. It looked as if they'd become Christians. But because they're not really trusting in grace, they might be vulnerable to the teachers of the law who are trying to encourage them to get right with God through the law. But they were maybe not saved in the first place. Or others who he's writing to who have really trusted in Christ, but they're just binding themselves up with regulations as they try to hold on to it with works, which they don't need to do. Paul talks a bit about the ones bringing these wrong ideas. They're cutting in on the Galatians. The Galatians are running the Christian race well. That's a, an image that's used in various places, of running the race for the Christian life. But someone's cut in. Reminds me of Zola Budd. Was it the 84 Olympics? She cut in on the American favourites and disaster ensued. But people were cutting in on the Galatians as they ran the race. And they're slowing them down in their run with, with God. They're throwing them into confusion, verse 10 says. Verse 8 says they're persuasive. They're they sound good in what they're saying. They have persuasive words. And the false teaching is like yeast in dough. It's, it can spread. And that's why Paul needs to deal with it, to stop it from spreading. Jesus used a similar image, doesn't he, about uh, a warning about sin, the yeast. Paul's probably not quoting Jesus here. It was an image that was used in the time of things spreading like yeast in the dough. Verse 11 is interesting. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Sounds as if Paul used to preach like the Judaizers, that he used to teach that you get saved, but you still need to get some circumcised and that. It's not 
easy to understand what exactly is being referred to there. It may be that they're thinking about, well, Paul used to be a Jewish rabbi and he would have preached circumcision then. Are they looking right back to then? Maybe. Or maybe when Paul first became a Christian, maybe in error, he still taught about circumcision. We're not sure. The Bible's not explicit about that. There was an occasion, and you can read about it in the book of Acts, when Paul was going with uh, another Christian called Timothy. Timothy was also from a Jewish background, but Timothy had not been circumcised. And when they went to Jerusalem, Timothy got circumcised. And they may be referring to that incident and saying, you know, oh, Paul agrees with us. He has people circumcised. But that was a one-off. And it was for cultural reasons rather than for reasons of earning righteousness with God. You see that false teachers sometimes will misquote people or misrepresent people to try and make their arguments as well. Paul says, obviously, I'm not still preaching circumcision because I'm being persecuted for the offence of the cross, or literally the scandal of the cross. Because, in a sense, the Christian message is offensive. I mean, it sounds fantastic, and it is fantastic. You can be saved by the work of Christ rather than by your own work. That's fantastic, isn't it? But actually, if there's pride in you, that's offensive because it says you'll never be good enough for God. You'll never be good enough. I'll never be good enough for God. That's an offensive message. You cannot save yourself by your own hard work. You can't save yourself by trying to be really, really religious or pious or holy. You can't save yourself. You're a rotten sinner. I'm a rotten sinner. That's an offensive message, isn't it? And that's what Paul means here, the offence of the cross. Because we can't. God's pass mark is 100%. And if we claim that we're that good, we're lying to ourselves. Which is why Christ has died for us and gives us his righteousness. But for many, that is an offence and a stumbling block because human pride wants to save ourselves. And that's why there are so many other religions in the world, because they're works-based. Part of the reason why there's so many other religions in the world, works-based, because there's the influence of, of the spiritual forces that want to lead people away from God as well. So giving a sense of power in religion, but not leading to faith in the true and living God. Verse 10 gives a warning indirectly to those who are bringing the false teaching. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty whoever he may be. Remember Jesus teaching, and uh, he mentioned at one time, if, if, if anyone's leading these little ones astray, it's better that a millstone be thrown around their neck and chucked into the river. You know, that's a strong warning of, against judgment if people lead Christians astray. And there's a warning there for them here. Paul obviously feels very strongly about this issue, as verse 12 suggests. You know, they're talking about circumcision. And Paul says, I wish they'd go the whole hog and emasculate themselves, castrate themselves. A bit of strong rhetoric. You know, if they're going to be wrong, let them go the whole way in their error. And then perhaps we'll see the truth of their error. The truth of their error, is that next? But they, they, they really are in error. So don't lose your freedom, which is ours through grace of Christ, through the grace of Christ. 
But then verse 13 reminds us that we shouldn't abuse it either. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Don't abuse your freedom. It's no license for sinful behavior. Rather, faith, we've already seen in verse 6, faith is expressed through love. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And in verse 13, Paul says, serve one another in love. Verse 14, the entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. And that phrase summed up could be translated as fulfilled, summed up or fulfilled. The, in essence, the law is about love, loving God and loving your neighbor. So actually, if the spirit is producing love in you because you love God and you love others because of the grace of God that you've experienced, then you're going to be fulfilling the law anyway, because you're living a life of love. And then verse 15 hints at what may be some of the problems in the Galatians church. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, Watch out, or you'll be destroyed by each other. There seem to be factions and disputes within the church. The opposite of serving one another in love. They're disputing and arguing and tearing each other down. Christian community should be love. There is a space for encouraging each other in the sense of exhortation, and challenge, admonishment but not a biting and a bickering about the right way to live for God. Just this last bit has turned into what we need to do, but the rest of the chapter and through into chapter six is going to follow on from there. So there'll be more in the next few weeks as well. So from here, from this passage, perhaps, what we see is uh, maybe at best returning to the law takes away the assurance that our freedom in Christ brings. At worst, returning to the law demonstrates that we may be never really trusted in the grace of God. But when we trust in God and when we're born of the Spirit, then we can have an assurance that verse 5 mentioned, an assurance of our salvation, an assurance, that future hope that we have to be righteous and to be with God forever. As I was preparing for this morning's message, the uh, first line of the first verse of this next song is what I couldn't get out of my mind. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. So this song is a, a little bit of a blast from the past. If you can remember the last time you sang this in church, you're doing very well. I can't remember the last time we sang it in church, um, but it's Jesus, we celebrate your victory. Jesus, we revel in your love. We rejoice you've set us free. Your death has brought us life.
This is screen. Day. May we revel in your love. May we rejoice. May we always remember the freedom that we have in Christ. And may that stir up a great love and gratitude in our hearts to serve you and to follow you. Praise you, Lord. Let's continue with a hymn which expresses some of the same things. It's even older than the chorus we've just sung. And can it be? that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood.
No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Lord, may we walk in the light of these truths in this week ahead. Thank you, Lord. Praise be unto you. Amen. Thank you. 